Hi everyone, and happy new year. Welcome to the INFJ live Q and A. And we're here with Kyle. Would you like to tell us a bit about you? Yes, Joyce. Um, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to be here with you. And good morning to everyone on, on the West Coast. Um, good afternoon and good evening. Uh, my name is Kyle Schultz. So I am an INFJ. Um, I live in Southern California and I own a small um, holistic acupuncture herbal medicine clinic with my wife. And that's that's pretty much all I do that takes up a lot of my time. I love psychology, philosophy, um, just thinking about the universe, ultimate reality, um, and everything in between. Yeah, thanks again, Joyce. Excellent, I'm glad to have you on, Kyle. There are so many NFs that are into holistic psychology, holistic health, and holistic spirituality. And so it's lovely to have you on. And so my first question for you is, what is your experience of introverted intuition? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, NI to me is a mental technology that allows access um, through intimations, through glimpses, through, um, you know, insights, visions, hunches, feelings, um, to ranges above and beyond this fixed limited reference point. Um, and the, intim the intimations and insights are, are signals. Ultimately, this is my personal opinion from the self, from the soul, from the divine indwelling within all of us, um, the psychic being. And that that psychic being acts as a guide through these intimations and through these intuitions. Um, it guides us to our fullest becoming, our fullest potential. And NI has the ability to receive these signals from the divine, but only if we're quiet. Um, I found that when I was able to still my mind through different practices, that that's really when those experiences came online for me, more or less. Mm hmm. Yeah. And you have some thoughts around non dualism and NI that I thought maybe if you wanted to go into, you could. I would love to. Yes. So, you know, m the mind is bound by logic. And what I mean by that, it's bound by a concept called the law of the excluded middle. And that's essentially a proposition that says um, it either must be true or false, you know, there's no middle ground. So if A is true, B cannot be true, if that makes sense. So it's essentially dualism. And um, because we're kind of ultimately in a society, um, in a culture that struggles with contradic contradictions, struggles with paradoxes, um, I think you know, more or less, you know, we're kind of raised to be either or thinkers. Um, you know, we're raised to compare, to judge, to choose sides. And non-dualism is exactly the opposite. Non-dualism um, is a kind of thinking that doesn't divide, but it unites and it sees all as one. And um, it's comfortable with paradox. And I think to a large degree, INFJs are comfortable with paradox and the unknowable um, because of the dominant NI function. Um, we don't need firm conclusions. You know, we can see the middle ground. We can see the grays of the black and white. Uh, we have an appreciation and patience with mystery. Um, so that's more or less non-dual thinking, um, you know, mystical thinking. It's a higher level of consciousness that has the ability to go beyond our subjectivity, to go beyond, like I was saying before, this um, fixed reference point um, to access, um, you know, give us access to both at the same time, the being and the becoming at the same time. Um, and more or less, once you have that experience, it's about making that experience stabilized. And, and that's really a life's journey. 
Yeah, and that's why Personality Hacker calls introverted intuition shifting perspectives, because it's yes, not just right. seeing the black or white. It's seeing, if you look at it from this vantage point, it would mean this, but to someone else looking at it from there, it would look like that. And so it's this ability to see the paradox within perspectives. You also see that they're actually not contradictory. They can go together in a very nuanced and complicated way. And so it's understanding the underlying subtext of reality, the underlying meaning behind reality and understanding from that, how to interpret the world through a lens that's not just yours, but from mm. a bird's eye view. And so- So beautiful, yeah, so beautiful. I just wanted to say one last thing, if I may. You know, it's a consciousness that doesn't watch everything, but it's a consciousness that is everything. And mm -hmm. I think that's ultimate non-duality. Mm. Mm -hmm. Got it. And so, Kyle, how do you experience extroverted feeling? Yes. Extroverted feeling. To me, you know, it's a radar that is constantly tuning in um, to the surrounding environment and picking up on the energetic, the emotional um, feedback. It gives me the feedback um, from nearby individuals and, and the collective. Mm. There, there is that component of extroverted intuition that, I mean, sorry, extroverted feeling <laughs> that yes. is scanning its environment as all extroverted functions do because they're externally oriented. So it's almost yes. like yes. having a thermometer on the outside emotional states, the vibration or the, uh, or the, the feelings being passed around I and how they're that. landing with people. Yeah. Exactly. It's, it's more of a, an energy really. And picking up on, you know, being able to see somebody's energy um, immediately, just immediately. I go into a room and not only picking up on the, the energy of the room itself, but the people that are in the room and you can tune into that, you know, immediately, like I said, it's like a radar. And then I kind of adjust my actions accordingly because of yeah. that. And there's some NF vibes to this too, because it's described in a very esoteric way. And <laughs> so I'm wondering, what yes. is your experience of introverted thinking? Yeah, so I came up with this analogy the other day. Um, you know, this is maybe one of those NI insights, I suppose. But really, you know, when you go down the function stack, it's like, um, you know, me wearing glasses, I'm blind as a bat without glasses. It's like taking your glasses off. And once you go down the stack, things become a little more blurry. Things become a little more fuzzy until you reach uh, your fourth function and, and beyond where things are unrecognizable. Mm -hmm. So we're, right now we're getting to, to um, a function that, that is a little bit blurrier than the other two. Um, but I will say for me, it's more or less just, um, um, you know, researching topics that interest me, um, or, you know, analyzing the insights, uh, for accuracy or, you know, just understanding a little deeper of maybe what they, that meant. Um, you know, I think in a negative way, it can come out as me being critical or, or judgmental. And I, I have noticed that over the years as well. Yeah. And our function in the tertiary spot is typically one we go to in times of play. It's a hobby function and a relief function. Right. So the particular way in which an, an INFJ experiences their introverted intuition is colored by TI because it's about almost, it's a little bit more detached than how an INTJ experiences their NI because that comes with FI. So there's a bit of a bit of that difference there. And so Kyle, how do you experience your last function, extroverted sensing? Extroverted sensing. Yeah, it's interesting because um, my wife is an ESFP and you know, this is her, her dominant function. So it's so funny seeing how I, interact with this function and, um, you know, how she does. And really to me, you know, it's, it's, it's all of the memes, all of the INFJ memes that we're used to, you know, very stereotypical 
not noticing surrounding objects, not living in the present moment, um, you know, being clumsy, um, walking into walls on occasion, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's really just not really being in the present moment. That's something that I've struggled with my whole life. And, you know, just being in my head or, or kind of disembodied, let's say, um, disassociated with my body, the environment, um, is really how I see it and experienced it. Mm -hmm. And it's also the part of INFJs where they struggle with details or they don't really care about details as much oh, as well. that that resonates with me yes <laughs> yeah it's it, you know the the corny saying you know seeing the forest for the trees and i think that's the infj we see the bigger perspective the bigger picture the details are a little harder for us to to be interested in i would say yeah and that's a huge differentiator between infjs and isfjs ISFJs are, and ISTJs are actually very good at the details, even if they don't care that much. It's something that comes very naturally and obvious to them. Whereas INFJs care more about the, all right, how can I get the larger context as quickly as possible? And then that's missing details and skipping over them in, in the first place. And so feel free that's to ask true. your questions in the live chat to the side. It doesn't have to be about typology. You can ask questions about life, utopias, like this question, or anything you'd like to know about under the sun. And I believe that that's a better way to get a type than to just ask straightforward questions. Because when we ask indirect questions, it allows us to hear more honest answers and that will reveal type indirectly in itself. And so the first one is, what does utopia look like to you? Right, so we're starting. We're starting with the big questions, huh? Um, yeah, it's it's a very important question. It's a very um, question that I think is on everyone's mind right now. You know, with the pandemic, the state of the world, the state of humanity. So, of course, it's something that I've been thinking about as well. A utopia, I mean, I'm not going to say um, my ideal version of a, a utopia, but something that I think is important to focus on and pay attention to. And that's how human beings are forever being molded and made into subjects um, by, you know, the mass market, by... Um, by companies, by organizations, by religions, by, you know, the government. Um, and I think it's really being aware of that, being aware of these other powers usurping our power, our own innate power within. And I think a utopia for me would be people um, empowering themselves once again, and how should I say this, you know, realizing that we all have a responsibility for, for our future, um, for the world, for each other, and taking the power of becoming, becoming our fullest potentials, you know, the whole idea of of Jung's um, individuation, um, which is essentially making everything unconscious conscious. Um, that to me is, is what becoming really is, you know, becoming being itself, becoming our fullest potential, becoming what we not yet are, but could be potentially someday. And I think ultimately the more people doing that, I think that would really help. And that would create a more um, harmonizing society culture overall. I feel like that would change a lot of the the problems of human existence. Absolutely, which is why there's such a big emphasis on unlearning and letting go yes. of the things that no longer serve you. Because anything that takes away your power, 
is a force that takes away something very valuable within you because you forget yourself every time you give something more power over you than you have power over you. And the thing is, it's insidious because you don't notice when it's happening because it happens incrementally. Yes. And it's akin to a frog boiling in a pot of water. So if yes. you put a frog into hot water, it's just going to jump out right away because it knows it's hot. But it's very insidious if you put a frog into warm water and then you slowly raise up the temperature, it'll get adjusted to it until the frog boils to death. And oftentimes incremental sources that make us forget who we are, are the most de deadly over time, but also the most unnoticeable. And you can't see it until you've really felt the impact of it. And at that point, mm -hmm. there's a bit of a sunk cost fallacy. You have to kind of give up a part of what you were doing before to take on a new path. And oftentimes it can be hard to to do that because it's it's like when you read three fourths through a book, do you want to finish the book even though it's a horrible book? Or, or do you want to start a new book but have a little bit of sunk fallacy in you where you're like, oh no, I wish I finished it. And it's just the yeah. there there is a cost to picking paths. So once you realize you have to unlearn something, you also have to give up something too. And that inner control freak in us can can find that to be hard. Yes. Yeah, it's really going against conformity in a lot of ways. You know, like I said before, there's outside sources, outside forces even, that are molding us into subjects. And it's really taking that power back and for you to have the, the the decision of what that subject will be, if that makes yeah. sense. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah, by unlearning, you are able to figure out almost the essence of your soul without the edits that the world has imposed onto it. That's beautiful, Joyce, yes. And so World War III are humans learning to get along, which is more likely to occur in the next two decades. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, um, you know, I'm, I like to be optimistic. Um, I'm going to say humans learning to get along. Mm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. That is, that is possible. Yeah. With the polarization in our culture, it'll be interesting, but yeah. It yes. would be nice to have everyone get along. What would need to be there for everyone to get along? What are the ingredients to getting along? Would you pause it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I'm into um, the, the, the poet, the philosopher, the spiritual, um, you know, the spiritual teacher, Sri Aurobindo, who I believe was an INFJ as well. And in his book, The Life Divine, he has a, a beautiful quote in the first chapter that states, the very problem of human existence is harmony. And harmony, you know, everything boils down to harmony, harmonization with each other, with ourselves ultimately. And what that would look like would be You know, ultimately, it's really like a, a cross, right? So it's an axis. And it's a vertical axis. It's a horizontal axis. You can approach, approach this from two different perspectives, but it will ultimately lead you to the same conclusion. And the horizontal axis is going inwards, and that's discovering the soul within. And the vertical axis is going upwards towards the divine. Right. And I think ultimately taking that journey, you know, I, I, I feel like that's necessary and important for everyone. Um, their version of the divine may be different. Um, it may be an aspect of the same divine, of course, but it's different based on your culture, your your um, upbringing, your, your family. Um, but understanding that we're all manifestations of the same, the same one um, ultimate, uh, you know, pure consciousness. And there is no other. 
the other is all there is in another way. You know, everyone is, is all there is. You know, every finite is infinity in itself in the here and now. And I think once you kind of, you touch upon that, you don't have to be stabilized in that, but once you have that experience, it's almost like an addiction, you want more. And it's a paradigm shift ultimately. And I think that's what it'll take. The more people that have those kind of experiences, I think, um, you know, even let's say 20% of the population could, could, could tip the scales in a, in a, a really optimistic way, I think. And that's what it'll take. Mm -hmm. Sometimes getting along is, has been argued to be at the price of diversity. So there's a beauty to the world because there are so many diverse opinions, but that also comes at the cost that some people argue of everyone getting along because with diversity, you come in conflict and with conflict, you, you get disharmony sometimes. And so it's very, uh, it's a very NF ideal to have this yeah. spiritual philosophy that leads to <laughs> unity, consciousness and unity of people. It, which is beautiful. I, I, well, I really admire it. <laughs> thank you, Joyce. Yeah, I mean, well, there's there's unity in, in diversity and diversity in unity, you know? And, um, well, anyways, that's what I think. So, yes, yeah. very true. Yeah, QZ calls the NFs the idealist. So they're somewhat utopians in their own sense. So they're like, you can both be diverse and get along too. So the NFs looking at the win-win solution, you can literally do this and this together. And that yes. could be and will be the reality that they see that they have like a vision of how the world could be. And so it's often manifested in this positive light where people's feelings yeah. get along and that the world is a better place. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, if you look at INFJs historically, you know, throughout human history, we're looking at people that birthed um, paradigm shifts. Yes. You know? um, I mean, look at Plato, look at Jesus, look at the Buddha, look at Sri Aurobindo, like I mentioned before, or Ibn Arabi or Plotinus. I mean, the list goes on, uh, Schopenhauer even. These are people that brought radical, profound paradigm shifts. And it, it, they all had a, a very similar kind of qualitative unity of, in their thinking, I would say, as well. Yeah. Uh, introverted intuition can have this element of paradigm shifts because it deals with how do I change my mindset or the way that I think about things? So that's the TI, introverted thinking, so that okay. the world can be a better place. And, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. What are some insights you've had in the past few days? What have you been thinking about? Um, cosmic lightning, that's a great question. Um, I've been thinking about this upcoming interview. Um, yeah, honestly, that, that that is really true. But um, um, some insights that you've had in the last few days. Yeah, that is a great question. I want to be honest, and um, I'm trying to dig deep and remember. And this is, I think, something I do struggle with memory. My memory is, is pretty poor. So that's maybe associated with SI being so, so far down in my stack. Um, um, that's why I also encourage people to write things down. Other INFJs out there, if you're listening, something that's really helped me writing it, you know, keep a journal or writing it in your phone. The note section, I have an iPhone, the note section of my iPhone is, I mean, jam packed with insights, ideas. Um, so I would say, um, yeah, like I was mentioning, you know, the, the glass analogy and th this is, you know, insights often show up to me, this is another thing we can, we can talk about, but um, symbols, you know, analogies, metaphors. So the, the, the symbol of, you know, me removing my glasses once you go further down the stack, that was an insight I did have in the last few days. They can be, you know, something really simple like that. They can be extremely profound. They can be everything in between. Um, but that, that is certainly one that I have, 
I have had within the last couple of days. Mm. A lot of insights sometimes INFJs will have is related to paradigm shifts. So it's like, oh, yeah. this is a this is a different way to see something or perceive something, huh? Um, yes. Like shifts in consciousness is something typically I, I hear a lot from INFJs and in myself. Right, um, and that's another thing that that's how I approach the FE now. You know, the F the FE is a a mental technology to exteriorize those paradigm shifts that I have internally, to talk about it, to, to bring it to the public, you know, um, you know, even if it's just my wife, my, my family, my friends, to just get it out there, I think really helps. And that's how I use my FE in a really healthy way, other than trying to, um, you know, just be this, this, comedian to try to make everyone feel better. Obviously, I still, you know, do that. I, I still care about people's feelings, emotions. I want to be there and supportive for them. But it's really about utilizing the FE in, in other ways, too. Mm. Are NI users more likely to feel and experience synchronicity? Um, I think everyone has that capability. Um, even my, my wife has experience of synchronicity, um, you know, being in, in touch with your dreams, I think is really, really important. They do show up quite a bit in our dreams. Um, and just being, being mindful, being aware of that, um, just writing things down, I think make, make a profound, um, difference that's helped me quite a bit in terms of kind of, um, you know, knowing what to look for, I think is, is a big thing too. Yeah. I, I feel like everyone can have them. Um, I wouldn't say disproportionately INFJs can only have them or, or NI DOMs. I, I think everyone really can. Mm. What's some most recent synchronicity that you've had? Oh man. I mean, a lot of times, you know, I have a, an acupuncture clinic here, herbal medicine clinic, um, you know, talking to my wife about a patient, you know, oh, I wonder how so-and-so is doing literally seconds later. I'm not even joking. No kidding. They call. I mean, that happens all the time. So that's, that's a really interesting one. Of course, there's other examples that, that don't pertain to my work, but it, it does happen quite a bit. Do you relate to a description some INFJs have of FE where they absorb other people's emotions? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I am a nine on the Enneagram. So I feel like nines have this problem as well. Um, being sponges, um, being hyper empathic, you know, kind of not knowing where I end and another individual begins you know, which I understand is very spiritual and, and it's beautiful, but in a sense, you know, kind of not having a, a, a concrete individuality is something that I've always struggled with and having people's emotions, feelings affect me. Yes, yes, they do. You know, oftentimes I'll feel, you know, uh, angry or I'll feel sad or I'll feel, you know, whatever emotion it may be. And, you know, I can't relate it to anything internally. I don't know where it's coming from. And then, you know, I'll see somebody close by that has a similar, you know, um, uh, you know, behavior or expression. And then I'll, I'll kind of put two and two together. But over time, you know, it, it took me a long time to realize that and understand that. But I always feel like I've been hyper empathetic. Yes. Or hyper em empathic. Sorry. Yeah. Being mm -hmm. hyper empathic is also a trait of the NF temperament as well. So you'll hear okay. a lot of NFs talking about being hyper empathic, even if they're FI. So it's the it's the curveball there because you'll 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 have a lot of SFPs who don't relate to being empathic, but you'll have a lot of NFPs who relate to being empathic. So it's also a trait of NFness. And right. highly sensitive personness too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, that's true. Mm. 
How do you trust that your NI and FE are the truth? I feel like I gaslight myself because no one ever believes me. Would you have any advice for how to deal with that? Yes. Um, Lacey, that's a great question. And yeah, how do we feel or how do we know when to trust our intuitions? That's something that, um, you know, took a long time and it's obviously an ongoing process. Um, I've been on a, a spiritual journey, a psychological journey for the last 12, 13 years. And it was really only within the time of, of having a consistent, regular, um, you know, disciplined practice that I was able to tap into some of these insights on a deeper level. I feel like I've always had them, but they were like I was saying before, very misunderstood, ignored, and I had to suppress them. I felt like, you know, other people maybe didn't relate to them or didn't want to hear them. And I was kind of this, you know, black sheep or outcast within, within the family, within the society. So I had to kind of adapt other, other aspects of, of uh, personality. And I had to kind of you know, uh, make another subject that, that wasn't my ultimate kind of subject, uh, my ultimate self, my, it was like this false self, you know, you can say if you're a Richard Rohr or Thomas Merton fan. Um, and over time, you know, kind of deepening the NI experience has led me to, um, to trust them, you know, maybe not at first, but you'll have a, a deepening of experience through, through repetitive experiences or experiences that all point and lead to the same conclusion, the same outcome. And it's really just about, you know, again, seeing the pattern, recognizing the, the patterns and recognizing that they all kind of point to um, similar conclusions that you can kind of um, through, you know, maybe NITI, um, understanding and, and seeing them as, as truths. And it, it really has helped me. They're all just different ways of knowing, ultimately, you know, these different insights, experiences, they're just different ways of knowing. They all kind of point like an arrow to to a similar conclusion. Mm hmm. Yeah. And it can suck when you have the right answer, but because you don't say it as confidently and boldly and as obnoxiously as the other person in the room, it's not taken <laughs> as seriously. Yes. So, oh man, I can resonate with that. Yes, absolutely. INFJs are quite rare. Uh, do you have any INFJs in your phone book? Any INFJ friends? What are your thoughts on the INFJ personality type? Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I mean, like I was saying to Joyce, I know very, very few INFJs. There is a, um, a patient in my clinic that identifies with the INFJ personality type. And, you know, it's interesting. It's like when you get two INFJs in a room, it's like a tuning fork, you know, it's like you just resonate and there's something about the, 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 the residence of the other, of the other INFJ personality type that, um, that resonates your own internal tuning fork. And you can tell right away, there's a, a qualitative, um, yeah, I know I keep on using the word residence, but that's the only one that comes to mind right now. And she's really the only one that I would say. Um, everyone else is really just through through the internet, through YouTube. I don't have any in my phone book. Um, it is a very rare personality type. And I feel like a lot of people, you know, um, say or identify with the INFJ um, through online tests, you know, taking an online test. And that isn't the best way to, um, to, you know, to, um, to reach this conclusion as, as fully identifying with this personality type, because I feel like other INFJs, like I said, will, will pick up on it. You know, they'll, they'll be able to tune in and tell. Yeah. The, the thing that sticks out the most to me is NFness. I can spot it from a mile away. It's those kind of 
beliefs that regular society would find a little bit too woo woo or too feeling <laughs> and too too impossible in the world but nfs believe in a better world just naturally like they don't feel like they're a part of the world but they feel like they're a catalyst to see the world in a new light and to make it better and there's something very inspiring about that kind of idealism you'll see nf idealism in martha luther, luther king <laughs> jr and yeah, his ability yeah. to articulate his vision for the world even if he's not seeing yes, it yeah. now it's almost like the more ideal world feels more real than the actual real world and that is yes, really yeah. beautiful Absolutely. one of the places yeah where Kyle is going to meet some INFJs is the INFJ mentorship and community program that me and Susan Storm for, of Psychology Junkie is setting up. Kyle is actually going to be there and he's going to be surrounded by INFJs. Yeah. Yes, very <laughs> excited about that. Yeah. Absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for that event, we have also some, you know, really famously known INFJs attending that, like Megan Malone, possibly from INFJ blog and more. So oh, exciting, can, yes. Yeah. Can you talk about your chosen career path and some suggestions you might give to other INFJs seeking a fulfilling career? Oh, another great question, yeah. Um, this is a relatively new career path for me, um, you know, more or less the last four or five years, I would say. So up until then, I mean, like many of us, I've had other jobs and um, I feel like I was operating from more of an F and FE, um, operating more even like an ENFJ in a way. Um, again, making people comfortable, making people laugh, um, just kind of being this optimistic kind of presence that kind of tunes into people's emotions and just kind of being supportive and being there for people. It didn't allow opportunity for me to go deep and it kind of express the depth that I do have. And only within this, this um, career of being a, a holistic herbalist, I, I really kind of see myself more or less as a therapist, as a spiritual director, even, you know, I, I work with herbal medicine, um, plant medicine, and work with Eastern medicine as well, and other forms of, of alternative uh, health and wellness. But really, it's just being being there for somebody creating a container. I think it's really important, creating a, a container that is safe and comfortable where they can express themselves. They can be vulnerable. We can go deep because ultimately what's, you know, the, the symptoms are just expressions or manifestations of, of something deeper. So I always want to go deeper. I never want to just put a bandaid on a symptom and, you know, having these other kind of mental technologies such as, um, and I can really, really help. Um, oftentimes, I'm talking with a patient, uh, a plant, a medicine will pop in my head. You know, it'll just be an insight. I'll have this vision. I'll have this either path for them to take that I feel like would be beneficial for them, a book that would be beneficial for them, a, a philosopher or somebody to look at, a practice, you know, like I said, an herbal, an herbal plant, um, something that will be ultimately beneficial for them. And that's oftentimes through affect affective um, intuitions, you know, it can be a feeling, even, um, it can be, like I said before, a symbol, uh, a, um, a metaphor. And this, this career has been extremely liberating for me to be able to express other other uh, mental functions, other technologies that I do have that are just so natural to me. And really, it's, it's just, um, it's been really lovely and, and just really amazing to, to be there for people. So thanks for that question. That's a great question. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't answer all of it, did I? So suggestions um, that you might have. Really just, um, I would say experimentation, you know, maybe try different paths, trying different jobs, and ultimately having a space that you 
you can, um, you know, that's safe, that's comfortable for you to express some of these deeper truths that you have, I think is really, really important. Mm. I, I hope I answered your question, Lacey. Mm, yeah. In, in my coaching career, I've found that sometimes people will open up to me about their life and it's like this accidental becoming a therapist without being a therapist. And it's like, oh, I actually really, really enjoy this. And so yes. I'm taking the educational path of becoming a therapist because I enjoy talking to people about the real deep issues that they're facing and helping them guide along the path. And just having that sort of intimate sharing or, or bonding is crack cocaine. So... Oh, gosh, absolutely. And it's just the ability to have a trajectory, a, a path and being able to see that, I think, mm -hmm. so clearly, you know, more clearly than I see it for myself. And I can really see it um, for other people, um, you know, right away, ultimately. And not everyone wants to go deep. And, and obviously, you have to respect that. You know, some people just want quick pain management, back pain, in and out kind of a thing. You have to be respectful of that, of course. But the patients that do want to go deep, uh, I, I really cherish and, and value that very deeply. Yeah, yeah. Helping people with the trajectory of their lives, helping them navigate through and figure out what their divine design is more thoroughly. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> you said it. You said it so much better than I did. Yeah. You're you're a wordsmith. What are you talking about? And so, <laughs> what do you think about the statement? All feelings are thoughts that are that you emote out of, or feelings are just thoughts being emoted. Do you think emotion and logic are inseparable? Wow. Okay. Um, I don't have a good response. Um, How about you, Joyce? How, you want to take a crack at that one? And I can kind of, um, that'll give me an opportunity to think about this a little more. Yeah, uh, I think that they are inseparable in the sense that they're always interplaying with each other in the same sense that cognitive functions are inseparable. So in a I sense, agree. you could say all of the INFJ's cognitive functions are interplaying with each other all the time. So they're inter in inseparable. But at the same time, you could also say you could separate them for the sake of understanding them a little better. So you could isolate them into a silo and, and try to describe the qualities of it. And so you can do that. But ultimately how things play out in reality is way more complex than just understanding it mentally. And so I think in practice, they are inseparable because they're always working in tandem. And in fact, right. oftentimes it is your emotional brain that is dictating your logical brain. We're all just kind of primitive beings with wrapping over our minds that is like slightly logical, but most of our drives are primitive and we don't even know it. Like the, the fear of scarce, scarcity comes from caveman right. days fear comes from caveman instincts of a bush rattling and you being prepared to save yourself. Right. And so oftentimes right. some of our emotions are tied into survival instincts that we later post hoc rationalize with logic. And so that's where the issue can come from, where there are not a lot of fully logical beings and our ego might want us to see ourselves as logical beings, but oftentimes we aren't. Uh, even in the fact that we judge a lot of people through first impressions, a majority is, wow, is a yes. sign of that emotional brain because you're trying to ensure your safety. Because if that bush rattles, you want to know what first impression that gives you. Is that a bunny rabbit or a tiger? And so we carry that on to meeting people for the first time. So oftentimes first impressions, they weigh 10 or 15 times more than meeting a person after that. And that's because of the caveman brain. And so our logic is often influenced by the little emotional sparks that we don't even know are going on. And then we come up with right. logic. Even the most logical of us do that. But what are your thoughts, Kyle? That's true. And the only thing I would add to that, you know, that was a beautiful response. Um, I would say, you know, being rationalistic is a relatively new phenomenon. Um, you know, in terms of the human condition. Um, that's, that's, you know, ultimately a byproduct of the enlightenment, 
Um, so we're looking at two, 300 years of really kind of preferencing the rational mind, preferencing the logical mind. Um, that wasn't always the case throughout history. So we're looking at, you know, other centers of intelligences within us. Um, I think, you know, everything is consciousness ultimately, but there's, there's degrees of consciousness. Um, our body has a degree of consciousness, you know, our organs have a degree of consciousness. The cells have a degree of consciousness. You can even go that, that far. Um, so the, it's really operating from, you know, different degrees and different perspectives again, and not, I, you know, maybe, you know, seeing them as, as separate, but also seeing them as just degrees of, of separateness, I would say. Mm. Mm. Well put. And so how do INFJs view the Yang symbol? So it's like that, that, that <laughs> it's like the, yes. yeah. Yes, yes. So the, the young symbol, um, we're looking at, that's, that essentially represents um, the solar energy, the light aspect. Um, it represents the, you know, if we, if we see a mountain, the, the side of the mountain that's essentially getting the sunlight and the other side of the mountain that's, that's kind of, um, you know, getting the, the shadow aspect of it, you know, it's not in direct relation to, to the sun. So the young is the, um, is also associated with, with heat. It's associated with, um, activity, um, with motion also. Um, yeah, I mean, you can break that down further. I, I don't know if I answered your question South Bar, but um, let me know if you'd like to go further with that. Yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful question. It's a symbol that that I I um, refer to quite a bit in my practice here. Um, you know, we it's an Eastern medicine um, practice, so of course the Yin and Yang symbol is is foundational. Um, very beautiful. How do you make good questions about any topic, and what is considered a good question, and why? A good question is, I feel like, you know, a good question presupposes a good listener. I would say somebody who asks good questions um, can listen deeply and they're not formulating a question while the other person is speaking. They're, they're listening deeply. Um, they're, they're operating from, you know, a, a perspective of, you know, receptivity. It's like, you know, a bowl, you can't, you don't want to have a bowl upside down when somebody's speaking, nothing can go inside the bowl. You want to have the bowl right side up that's empty and receptive. And that's how I would view that. Mm hmm Yeah. What is a good question about any topic? It's one where you can elicit the passion from someone. So if you're able to frame a topic in which the answer lights up the person answering, if you can make it, if, if you can phrase it in a way where the person is able to share something that makes them passionate, you've, you've won because you've hit on some sort of gold. It means something to them. The question uh, has some sort of relevance to their perception. And so you're going to learn a lot from that. Um, a good question is also one that you ask in a way where it's sincere curiosity and not to come in with trying to answer a predetermined agenda. So right. it's, a, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree with that. That really resonates with me, Joyce. Absolutely. Mm. And so how do you describe your NI? Um, yeah, I feel like we, we did touch upon that before. Um, um, just briefly, it's, it's the, um, the cognitive, um, technology that I use to receive signals, um, from, from the, um, the self, from the soul, from the divine, the divine indwelling within, you know, um, and that really acts as a, a guiding uh, principle. And if you're receptive um, over time, 
Um, that, that again, acts as a guiding principle and just being more kind of allowing space and opportunity um, for you to kind of be receptive uh, of, of those um, experiences. I hope that helped. But again, you know, we did talk about that a little bit earlier in the video. Uh, maybe when Joyce uh, posts this, you can you can watch the beginning of this. Mm hmm. You mentioned keeping a journal or notes. Do you review your notes? I have notebooks filled electronic and on paper, and I find it hard to keep them organized or utilize them later. Do you have a system? Yeah, um, you know, something that's really helped me is Google Docs. Um, it's it's so easy because you can access it from, you know, virtually any computer. It just saves it there. That's something that's really helped me. I used to just write everything in my phone, but then, you know, I'd, I'd go into the office and we have different computers there. I can't access or see everything. Um yeah, I, I also have uh, journals where I do write things down, but I do, you know, lately, I would say within the last year or two, really favor Google Docs have really been um, really been great, I think, in terms of me kind of, you know, having those those NITI loops and I can just kind of get all of this out instead of just internalizing everything. I, I think it really helps to kind of create a perspective where um, you're you're looking at it objectively, I think ultimately helps. It's like going to see a therapist, you know, talking about problems um, helps to get it out there so you can see it from a different perspective. And I think that's ultimately what journaling and note taking does for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a therapeutic quality to journaling, too. So if you can't mm -hmm. afford therapy, that's one of the alternatives you can use to process your feelings, <laughs> too. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there's a beauty to to writing things down because you, you don't have to put your bandwidth on remembering them. It's already somewhere. So that now you can just entertain metaphysical thoughts without worrying that you're going to forget to pay your phone bill. <laughs> right. Yeah. I think you touched upon something really profound there, Joyce. Um, you know, having a, a clean internal environment is also helpful. Um, and again, you know, some of the practices, like I said, help me to do that. And also getting things out, I think, helps you to do that as well. It's like a clean mm -hmm. internal and external environment really aids in the cultivation of NI, ultimately. Absolutely. So yeah. I'm an INF, yeah. And so I'm an ENFP, and I know a couple of INFJs that are very close to me. And I love them very much, and they help me be a better person. Is there an MBTI type that can make you feel like that? Oh, that's sweet, yes. Thanks for saying that. That's that's really lovely. Um, you know, people that I've personally really bonded with, um, outside of my wife, of course, um, are INFPs, I would say. Um, a lot of my close friends have been INFPs. And oh, man, I mean, they're they're just like INFJs. You, they can really go deep. And it's it's just really amazing. So I, I would say that. Mm hmm. Yeah. I would answer. Oh, oh, go ahead. I would I'm answer sorry. with INFP and ENFJ for that. Yeah. Beautiful. And sometimes, yes, yes. sometimes ENFPs, depending on the ENFP. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But any type that is developed and paves the path of a good role model in terms of character, or what they're doing in life, or their philosophy with life, is a growth agent. So it doesn't have to be strictly an MBTI type. Um, no, that's true. And like we mentioned before, having the ability to see different perspectives and see as all of them being true and, and helpful, ultimately, in, in the, the cultivation of, of our potentials, I think, is, is a very good point, Joyce. Yes. Mm. If you had the opportunity to have three wishes, no rules, what would they be? Oh, man. <laughs> um. Marina, that's a great question. So, wish for infinite wishes, obviously. Okay, yes. That was so funny. That was so I funny. relate to that. Yes, exactly. Um, so, three, three wishes, no rules. What would they be? Okay.
Um, I wish I, I could see the, oh, I'm sorry, I'm hitting the desk here. Um, that wasn't an earthquake. So I wish um, humanity would live up to the potential that I, that I see in them, mm -hmm. ultimately. Um, I, I see so much and it, it really breaks my heart to to see the struggles, you know, out there. And um, I would say, you know, that would be number one, that that would maybe take up three of them right there. <laughs> um, can I just give you one really good one? That, that's the one I'm going to stick with. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to have to think about the other two, but that's a great question. Mm. Yeah, there's a little bit of a devastated idealist within you. It's like, oh, I see how the world could be or how the global society could be and they're not that. So it's a little bit uh, <laughs> soul crushing. Yes. Yeah, I think there is some of that, you know, um, seeing what it could be ultimately having the vision of, of human evolution and what what that ultimate vision um concludes i i think is is definitely one of the insights and you know we're gonna get there i'm, I'm gonna i said before i'm an optimist so yeah we're gonna get there mm -hmm. could you elaborate on your spiritual journey a little bit was there something that triggered the journey and how do you think it's changed your perspective in general oh it's it's changed my perspective tremendously and it's it's really it's really the core of of my subjectivity at this point. It's the core of, of my life um, in a lot of ways. Um, it, you know, like I said before, it all started around 12, 13 years ago, just kind of getting into different disciplines, different traditions, ultimately, um, with a hunger, with a curiosity more than anything. Um, I, I grew up um, going to a Catholic church um, I wasn't baptized. My, my parents were very, very liberal Catholics. Um, you know, we went two, three, four times a year, um, you know, and ultimately I didn't really find it satisfying. Um, it only was until I would say college that I, that I started to explore other traditions. And I think the first tradition that I explored was um, Zen Buddhism and just diving really, really deep, like a classic INFJ would, um, buying every book possible, going to temples, learning different meditation practices, um, going deep with that for many years, um, getting into other forms of Buddhism. Um, the Mudyamaka, which is a form of Tibetan Buddhism that Nar Nagar Nagarjuna um, ultimately expounded um, going deep with that for a little bit, going deep with Pure Land Buddhism, um, Chan Buddhism, which is basically the Chinese equivalent to Zen or Sun in Korean. Um, and then exploring um, Christian mysticism. So kind of having another look at um, Catholicism from a mystical um perspective. You know, the form of Catholicism that I was exposed to was a flattened, flattened, dumbed down version. Um, not obviously exposed to a lot of the amazing Christian mystics. I mean, unbelievable. Meister Eckhart, um, Teresa of Avila. I mean, these people are, are incredible. Um, and that's obviously approaching spirituality from a devotional perspective, right? Um, getting into that for a long time and really trying out all of these hats. And when I got into something, I really got into something, you know. And then ultimately kind of coming to a dead end or a wall, I would say, a boundary and feeling like I wanted more, um, just feeling hungry for something more. And then finding a Dwaita Vedanta. And that's kind of ultimately where I'm still... Um, swimming in the pools of Advaita Vedanta. And Advaita Vedanta essentially is, is non-dual, not to Advaita. And uh, Vedanta um, technically 
means the end of the Vedas. Um, so um, kind of studying the Upanishads. And these are, you know, ancient um, Sanskrit texts um, from India that talk about non-duality from different vantage points, different perspectives. And I mean, wow, I realized that was, that's ultimately the this, this summit that's at the top of, of the, the spiritual mountain. And I mean, it's incredible the, the depth it has. I mean, it, it really satisfied me on all levels and, and really going deep with that and, and still, you know, still trying to wrap my head around some of those concepts, but it's, you know, it's a lifelong journey and, and process and path, and it's been amazing. And, you know, I, I appreciate all spiritual traditions, even getting into Sufism for a little bit. Um, I mean, they all bring something beautiful to the table, and I, I love all, all of these wisdom traditions, I think, are just um, lovely and, and amazing, and I, I appreciate all of them. I, I yeah. hope I answered your question. Non-dualism is a very NI dom and NI auxiliary type of spiritual belief that a lot of them gravitate towards is, is a theme. So what are yeah. some of the... Oh, I'm sorry, Joyce, if I could just say one more thing about that. Yeah. Okay, yes. You're right. I, I do agree with you. And I will say all, you know, maybe you know, not including Confucianism and some of these other forms of, of traditions, all of them really at their, their core do have experiences of a underlying um, oneness or unity or non-dual kind of um, uh, manifestation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I did find that in Christian mysticism. I found that in, in Buddhism. It's just different flavors, di different words, obviously, but really pointing to the same underlying um, conclusions and concepts. And then, you know, obviously something like Advaita Vedanta really focuses on that, um, um, you know, more fully. But I would say all, all traditions can kind of penetrate to those depths if you want to go there. Mm. Mm -hmm. Are you guys into tarot or would you like to share some religious spiritual beliefs that you practice? Yeah, so Lacey, um, I feel like the second question um, was something that we just kind of went into and I love talking about religious and spiritual beliefs. So if you have another question about that, I'd love to go deeper and, and um, expound on that a little further. But the tarot, you know, honestly, is something I never really got into. Um, I, I, I know, um, Jung was really into it. It's, it's very much linked to symbols, images of the unconscious. And I, I understand the whole kind of, um, uh, purpose of it and everything, but it's something that I, I never really got into. Um, Lacey, are you into tarot? And that, is that something that sh should I get into? Yeah, I've heard that. I've heard that a lot of NI users tend to like tarot, but yeah. I also know a lot of ISFPs who are mm. NI tertiary into tarot. The, the biggest grouping of people who are into tarot, of, of course, correlation is not, not speaking for the individuals, is ISFP. You'll see the largest correlation with tarot card reading. And I know some ENFPs are into it as well. Uh, Oh, that's beautiful. ISFPs are, are so uh, just really focusing on aesthetics and beauty and poetry and, and tarot cards are beautiful. Absolutely. So that makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And sometimes people have fixations on their tertiary function too. And so they play with the NI through those things as well. I find FPs mm -hmm. tend to like those type of tarot, tarot stuff too. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Um, that's beautiful. And a NI dom, what do you think about the non-existence of free will, at least in our current understanding of fundamental workings of our universe? Mm. Right. That's a great question. And something I, I have um, contemplated on. Um, yeah, I mean, when you really go deeper, um, you know, who am I ultimately, right? Um, who you think you are ultimately isn't who you are. 
how much control authority do you actually have over your life? Um, you know, ultimately we're, we're a false self. We're small mind. There's a big mind behind that. There's a seer that's seen the body, the mind as an object. And that's, um, that's really what ultimately it means. Um, you know, you know, when you go take out the trash, who is taking out the trash? You know, who's, who's moving the body, who's moving the organs that are, that are making it possible for you to do that. Um, even, you know, you know, with young, the collective unconscious unconsciously controls a lot of us unconsciously. Wow. That's a lot of unconsciousness in one sentence. Um, so yeah, I mean, you can look at it from different perspectives, but yeah, really it's just kind of understanding and giving up on the control that we think we have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's the projector and there's the projection and oftentimes there's right. an ego urge to identify with the projection. It's the same type of comparison between the clouds and the sky. So we tend to identify with the clouds when really we are the sky and we are the, the oneness surrounding all of it instead of the, the current thing in front of us. That's a beautiful analogy. I, I have heard that as well. Yeah, I mean, the seer and the scene are different. The mm -hmm. seer and the scene are different, you know. Um, your subject subjectivity actually isn't your subjectivity. Um, if it's an object, it's it's not you. You know, mm -hmm. anything that's an object ultimately isn't you. So that's that's how I would would like to answer that question. Uh huh. Yeah. I and also the existence of free will depends on how you define free will too. Now, in some ways, right. we don't have control over our genetics or the, our environment sometimes until we are aware of it, but even our awareness of becoming aware of it comes from our innate ability to become aware of it. So where does that innate ability to become aware of our awareness come from? Is it mm. from our ownness or is it from something outside of ourselves, outside of our control? And so. Yeah, that's beautiful choice, yes, wow. How do INFJs deal with their trickster TE? So trickster TE, um, you know, I'm not as proficient in, in um, TE. Um, Joyce, would you give everyone a description of what TE is? And then I'll, I'll um, answer your, your question, um, Jun Gu. Yeah, so the behavioral manifestations of TE, so this isn't necessarily TE, but this is how it commonly manifests, mm -hmm. is the focus on efficiency, getting things done, building systems, systematizing, structuring, delegating, okay. knowing what, what resources need to go where to accomplish an end goal. So almost knowing the tasks needed to get to an end. And it's the ability to sequence to an end point. So TE is also this ability to know how to structure things to get the end result that you crave. And right. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know what they mean by trickster. So I, excuse me if I sound ignorant here. Um, I would say with that, you know, just being able to have a vision of the future and kind of systematizing steps to reach that goal or to reach that process, I think is something that the INFJ, it, it's pretty natural, I would say. Um, in terms of delegation, you said, oh, I really struggle with that. And that's, again, kind of, um, it could be an INFJ thing. It could also be an Enneagram 9 thing. Um, I like to just kind of blend in more or less with, with the people that I'm surrounding. Um, so I really struggle with kind of, you know, being, being forceful and, and being aggressive and telling people what to do, um, you know, avoiding conflict, those, those sort of things. So that could maybe be the trickster. I'm not sure what he means, but um, that's what I would say for now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I find 
that to hold true with all of the INFJs that I've interviewed. They tend okay. to, <laughs> INFJs tend to say the phrase, no matter their Enneagram type, I don't like delegating. It's, it feels weird to, to give people roles and it, it feels right. pushy and forceful and bossy. And it's like, yeah. <laughs> no, absolutely. Yes, yes. Of course. What are your thoughts on the ESFP personality type? How do you get along with ESFPs? Oh, I love ESFPs. Um, you know, my wife is an ESFP, so I'm biased here. ESFPs, you know, in a way they're made for this world. And what I mean by that, they can they can step outside and they are in their environment. You know, literally they're in the environment, they're present. Um, they're more mindful than I'll ever be in terms of their their external surroundings. And I really, I'm envious of that in a way. Um, they have so much energy and they're just so, so fun. I mean, they can break out in song and dance at, at any time. And it's just, it's such a blast to be around. Um, I'm definitely way more serious than my wife and way more contemplative and, um, um, you know, just kind of tend to think a little more deeply. Um, she makes everything a little more um, manageable, bearable. Um, she breaks me out of my comfort bubble, the comfort zone. Um, she's just so much fun to be around and, and really, you know, obviously very different than me, but there's, there's a balance between us. And again, going back to that, the yin and yang symbol, the Tai Chi symbol, um, I think it's important for a relationship to to bring out those other aspects that are innate hidden within us. And, and I feel like we kind of balance each other out in a beautiful way. That was a really amazing response. How Thank can I actually it. focus on something without being so perfectionist? I have an NI vision, but I always end up dropping my projects. True. And that's something that I, I do struggle with as well. Um, Diego, I don't think you're alone. Obviously, this, this is a stereotype for INFJs, perfectionism. Um, you know, a, a, a psychological um, theory that I find really fascinating and interesting is the IFS. And that stands for the internal family systems. Joyce is nodding her head. She likes this. Um, really beautiful because... You know, I feel like the 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 critical um, inner critic, the perfectionist, is a part. They would say so. That's part of the family. Um, that's not your true self. Um, that's a part that that um, kind of broke off um, from a a age of early childhood that acts as a survival mechanism. Um, you know, it's just ultimately there, it feels like it's, it's helping us, you know, it feels uh, like it's there for a purpose and it's, it's not to be viewed as a bad thing necessarily. It's to be viewed as, um, you know, with compassion, with love to give it an opportunity to, to speak and to be heard, I think is really important. That's something that's helped me quite a bit. Um, seeing all of these different fragmented parts within ourselves as, um, you know, just that they're, they're fragmentary or particles of the whole, you know, um, the image of, of completeness is within all of us. And that's really ultimately the self. And these parts are kind of there to act as bodyguards, act as barriers, act as um, forms of protection um, from the self. And it's just about making a relationship with them and giving them an opportunity to, to be heard and, um, you know, to, to tell them ultimately, I, I see you, I hear you. Um, you helped me. You were there for a long time, but you know, your, um, your protection isn't needed anymore. I think it's really helpful. Um, it's not necessary anymore, and I appreciate for everything that you did, but um, I think I'm okay now, and it's not necessary, uh, you know, a necessary 
um, role that that you have to um, to partake in and just kind of giving it an opportunity to dissolve on its own. Once you kind of you face it, you acknowledge it, it'll ultimately dissolve on its own. It, it might not happen at first, you know, it could take a couple sessions, a couple months even, um, depending on how concrete and solidified it really is. Um, but I think over time, having a disciplined practice on going within and kind of confronting these different parts within um, can really, really help. Uh, I hope I answered your question, Diego. That's a beautiful question. Internal family systems is super dope. And yes. there is an element of Mary Kondoing it. So Mary Kondo is this house clean cleaner. Like she helps people who hoard to clean up their houses so that they're more, their interior of their be dwelling is more beautiful and less cluttered and more minimalistic. And so it uses the same principles as IFS, which is you thank the part for playing its part. So with Mary Kondo, you thank items in your house for being there and serving the role that it served at the time. And then you let it go. And you do the same for your thoughts too. So you have this side of you, the perfectionist side, it served a purpose, but it's no longer needed. So it's thanking it for, thank you for being here when I needed it at the beginning. But now uh, I would like to part ways with this. Um, and so there's this yes. element of honoring everything that has entered you. And that's the best way to let it go. Because if you don't acknowledge that it's a part of you, it'll hold hissy fits until you do. And so it's mm. better to just treat it like an equal. So if your mind is a council, you, you can't put sides of yourself all covered in ropes and everything in the closet. Like you cannot throw a part of you and then lock it in the closet or lock it in a jail cell. Yes. That side of you is going to rebel in the form of taking up more of your consciousness than needed. And so the best way to um, work with those negative sides of you is to take that side of you out of the closet that you stuffed it in and to have it as a voice in the council until it's ready to part ways. So you almost yeah. have to accept it in order to let it go, almost. That was very well put, Joyce, beautiful. Um, I would just like to add a couple more things on that. Um, you know, yeah, really when we ignore it, when we suppress things, we repress things, they, they still take up life force. They still take up chi within us or energy within us, right? So they're still operating um, from a place of ener energy exhaustion. They're still taking our energy. They're still taking up space within us. And they're not going to go away. I think that energy will ultimately just grow and it's, it's never going to go away until we, we face it, like you said, with compassion and it'll dissolve and you're going to ultimately get that energy back and you can use that energy for something more fulfilling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it goes on to this concept of if you want to develop a new habit, you have to remove friction. And so sometimes the friction to becoming your best self or to become the person you want to be is the mental friction we have. So these mental barriers of perfectionism or mental barriers of not good enough, and you really have to deal with those sides of you in order to remove the friction you need to actually finish the things that you, or be the person that you want it to be. Oh, right. not finishing right. things is a symptom of something deeper. So all of these things that are, are that look like procrastination are typically symptoms of something internally not fully processed. And so what do you think of spiritual materialism and spiritual bypassing? Um, Yeah, I'm not too familiar with spiritual materialism. I think that was um, um, a book written by a Tibetan Buddhist monk. I, f I forget the gentleman's name. Um, I haven't read it, so I'm not going to speak from a place of authority on that. Spiritual bypassing, I think, can be a real problem. And, you know, often you'll see that within the new age, um, you know, people that are chasing experiences, um, chasing spiritual experiences, um, you know, the use of psychedelics is a good example. 
Um, these are people that want to bypass psychological development. Um, and it's really inseparable in, on, on many levels. And we, we've kind of touched upon that. Um, you have to, you know, bringing up the, the IFS, um, these different parts within us, you have to you have to confront these different parts before you can access some of the, oh, I'm sorry, some of these uh, more spiritual parts within. Um, hello, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. All right, I'm sorry, there we go. Um, yeah, what was I saying? So yes, you have to, you have to access, I think, go through some of these more psychological components before, before you can ultimately have some of the um, spiritual experiences that will offer lasting change. Um, you know, and this is where I think Ken Wilber's idea of stages and states, um, another INFJ, Ken Wilber, I love his work. Um, he, he says, you know, you can have any state of consciousness at any stage of development. And I think he really differentiates the two on a really beautiful, um, you know, system. It's a beautiful theory. Um, and I, I think that's a really um, profound insight ultimately because you see very quote unquote advanced spiritual practitioners, um, you know, just kind of, you know, doing, you know, um, doing things that are, that are kind of, um, what's the right word? I'm, I'm failing to find the right word. Just kind of doing things that are inappropriate, maybe is, is a good word. Um, you know, like they're abusing people, they're, you know, even molesting people, they're stealing money. I mean, there's so many different stories about these spiritual teachers that have done, done kind of um, inappropriate things throughout the years. So just because you have a, a profound spiritual experience, it's different than going through these different levels of psychological development. So you can be at a level of a very low level of psychological development and have a really profound spiritual experience. And they, they are kind of different, I think. And it's, it's important to kind of look at them as, as being different and to ultimately approach them together, I think is really important to approach them um, from the level of psychological development um, that'll lead to spiritual development, ultimately, I think is, is a better way to maybe say it or, or see it. Mm. Does your relationship dynamic usually play out between sensor and intuitive dominance? How does your relationship? Really... Sorry, my bad. Okay. <laughs> no, that's okay. Relation dynamic usually play out between sensor dominance. Okay, so again, the e I'm going to use the ESFP as as the example here, and. Um, I think it's a beautiful relationship and it's a beautiful relationship that offers um, balance and offers different perspectives. And one is more present, the other one is more future oriented. And I think if you get those two together, um, it offers a very well-rounded kind of approach to, to seeing goals, to planning, um, yeah, I, I think it, it can be a very beautiful relationship, just kind of different ways of, of ultimately seeing, seeing the world. Um, um, yeah, I, I think that's, that's what I would say with that for now. I, ho I hope I answered your question. Rainy day commenter, yes. Mm -hmm. that's a great day. Do you get satisfying resonance on your insights from sensor dominance or do they help you bring yourself to the present moment more through humor, et cetera? Um, I wouldn't say I get satisfying resonance. Um, I think there are certain types that you can explore some of these insights with more than others. Um, sensor dominance tend to just want to get to the point. You know, they're they're not as patient. They're like, 
Um, they get turned off or bored pretty easily. I, I found when I'm trying to explain some of these more profound insights that I've had. Um, so they don't, they, I wouldn't say they're, they're great people to resonate on the insights, but they're great. They're great people to do many other things with, you know? Um, so I, I would say that, um, definitely with the humor, of course. Yeah. They, they, they just kind of bring a, a lightness and a sense of, um, easy going, you know, going with the flow kind of less heaviness and dread that INFJs can experience at times. Yeah. Just this, this lightness, this upbeatness, let's say. Yeah. Beautiful. Mm. What makes you feel the most accomplished and what makes you feel the most sad? Oh, wow. Lex, that's a, that's a good question. So the most accomplished, I would say, you know, speaking from my practice, helping patients, if I can, if I can get them to a place of, um, of wholeness, I feel accomplished. You know, if I can be a part of that process, if I can be, like we were saying, um, you know, a therapist or a, a spiritual director and offer guidance or offer suggestions even if I can be a part of that process in any way and see them, um, you know, kind of receive the fruits of some of the practices, I feel accomplished. That, 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 that's a lovely, just amazing feeling. Um, what makes me most sad is when they don't accomplish what I'm saying. No, I'm kidding. Um, what makes me most sad yeah, I would say, you know, kind of going back to what we were saying before, just ultimately um, seeing the vision of humanity and seeing that it's not living up to, um, you know, the insights that, that I've uh, um, experienced, seeing not what, not, um, you know, that it's just not kind of reaching its, its fullest potential, I think. Um, I don't know. Maybe that's what I would say. Yeah, that's that's what comes to mind for that. That that's always made me sad. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's also a really accomplishing feeling when you help someone save time. So it's almost like they would have learned that insight or paradigm shift forty years from now. But because you offered them that paradigm shift now, they saved forty years of their life searching for that insight. And wow. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Very, very, very true. Yes. What does meditation influence? How does med meditation influence type? Does it develop intuition or bring the mind here and now? Strengthen SISE. Alternatively, can it alter the order of functions themselves? Mm. Well, starting with the last question, can it alter um, the functions themselves? I'm not too sure about that, but I do. You know, certainly when I'm working with a patient, I tend to approach um, guidance, at least um, with meditation, seeing that all types are different and all, you know, types kind of approach meditation differently. Um, not all meditations are the same. And I wouldn't give somebody, um, you know, I would say sensors tend to meditate better when they're doing something. Um, so I have noticed that I'll give, um, you know, SE, SI DOMS, you know, forms of meditation, like walking meditation, um, even walking in nature. I, I see them um, finding that very useful and very helpful. Meditations where they're, um, you know, maybe painting or, you know, doing something else that'll maybe perhaps unlock different flow states. Um, tends to work really well with them. If they're introverted, you know, they can handle solitude. They can, they can handle quiet time alone. So, you know, they can, they can probably handle some of the more kind of, you know, I would say traditional forms of meditation or prayer even. And that really, you know, just kind of over time, understanding where they're coming from, you know, really getting deep with these people and offering, solutions that kind of fit 
um, fit their, you know, particular manifestation, I, I would say, um, you know, everyone's different. So they're, they're kind of approaching things from a different angle or different perspective. So just being able to meet them where they are and give them advice that'll, that'll ultimately help them best with, with their particular uh, type or identity. Mm. I hope that made sense. Yeah. It's a, is spiritual mm -hmm. materialism when someone thinks they are spiritual but are very consumerist, like buying expensive ah. statues of Buddha? Probably, Jonathan. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And to talk about the last point that Kyle was talking about, um, you talked about customizing the meditation towards the, the person, right? And so yes. Linda Behrens right now, she's creating a quadra theory for MBTI. So before only socionics group the types by functions, but Linda Behrens is coming up with a theory on how to group the types by functions in MBTI. And what she calls the NFJs and the STPs is the customizers, I believe, or something like customizing is what she calls it. Okay. And you you demonstrated that just now, Kyle, when you talked about you you customize your approach depending on the person that you're dealing with. And so that's oh, a yes. That's an element of extroverted sensing being in the moment and FE adjusting itself to the needs of the in the momentness. And so there's that. That's the, great. And I, I relate to that. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that, yeah. that seems about right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the introverted intuition and the TI are figuring out the framework or the under not underlying principles of reality in order to customize well. So that you, yeah. you really are the whole gamut. And so feel free yes. live chat to ask your burning questions to the lovely, holistic, loving Kyle. <laughs> feel free <laughs> to make it about all things spiritual, metaphysical, life oriented, whatever is at the top of your fancy at that moment. You literally can ask any question under the sun, but that probably doesn't narrow it down and stress, stresses you out. So I'm sorry <laughs> if that was too out of range. But we have a smaller, more intimate live chat group today. So it allows you to get your question answered for sure. And so why pass up that opportunity? This is the once in a lifetime exactly. type of setting. And so something that is very Kyle is another YouTuber that's an INFJ, actually, and his name is Clayton Arnold. And they they have a similar vibe. And so there are typically subtypes within INFJs. And I think like Kyle has a Clayton Arnold vibe. And so he's within that archetype of INFJ. Um, or Clayton has a Kyle vibe. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And so while we wait for questions to trickle in, how has it been like being a holistic practitioner of, is it acupuncture or herbal medicine? Um, yeah. So uh, my wife is the, the um, licensed acupuncturist. I just do the herbal medicine, um, both Eastern and Western. Um, I'm certified as a Western herbalist, but trained with, um, um, my wife's father for a very long time. He's an acupuncturist. So my wife is second generation. And I trained with him for a very long time in um, more of the traditional, um, they're Korean. So the traditional Korean way of approaching and utilizing herbal medicine, um, which is beautiful and I love. So what it means to be holistic to me really means being able to approach health on multiple different levels. And health to me isn't just the physical, it's the mental, it's the emotional, it's the spiritual. So being able to kind of go deep and tap into these different aspects of ourselves and choosing herbal remedies that best fit their particular manifestation of that aspect that's out of balance, if that makes sense. Mm, gorgeous. Yeah, that's a great question, yes. Yeah, 
And Kyle also makes Enneagram bracelets too that are scented with the specific scent that embodies the Enneagram type. So if you're into that, go check it out in the links below. <laughs> yes, thank you, Joyce. Yeah, actually, I just want to say my, my wife uh, makes those. Um, I really just kind of stand in the background um, while she does all the work. No, I mean, it, it was really a, a passion project that we had. We do want to get more into aromatics. Um, this year, I was going to say next year. I can't believe it's 2022 already. Um, this year, in a couple months, actually, I will be being um, getting a certification in, in aromatics and essential oils. So really wanting to bring that into the clinic more. I think um, aromatics are, are very powerful, especially when it's, it's in the format of a bracelet that you can just kind of wear it around everywhere. I think it's a great accessible way to to get access to some of these um, aromatic molecules. So thanks for saying that, Joyce. I appreciate that. Yeah. And scent can dramatically improve your mood too. And so. Yeah, so it actually, interestingly, it actually um, goes directly to the limbic system um, that unlocks um, memories. And that's why a lot of people have strong memories associated with scents. So it bypasses a lot of the filters within the brain itself, and it accesses more on an, you know, instinctual, visceral, unconscious, um, even um, part of ourselves. So it, it, it's great for shadow work. It's great for unlocking and kind of going deep within the psyche. A uh, very powerful tool. Yes. Mm -hmm. What would you say INFJs need the most from people and what INFJs want people to know about them? Okay, yes. Um, another great question. There may be a small group of people um, with us here today, but um, everyone is, is very intelligent. These are great questions. Thank you so much. Yes, you, you have the, the best subscribers, Joyce. Um, you know, what INFJs want people to know about them? Um, you know, I think giving us, we're, we're, I think we're relatively slow people, you know, um, we need time to express ourselves. And the other thing to say about the NI is it's almost like, you know, we need like a gestation period. We need like an incubation period to kind of bring these insights, um, and to make them, you know, bring these insights onto paper or, you know, into our psyches and, and bring them out into ex the external um, reality. Um, and I think it, it requires time and, and patience and just being open to that and, you know, kind of seeing that, you know, we are kind of slow and it, it takes us a while to kind of format and understand uh, what we're trying to say even. Um, so just being open to that. Um, what if what do INFJs need the most from other people? I don't need anything from other people. Yeah, I would say um, for them to be I like when people um, feel feel like it's safe to, you know, like I said before, kind of express different aspects of themselves, um, you know, further from the surface, I would say. And, and I think INFJs really, I wouldn't say need that, but we like that. We definitely like that. And I think all INFJs can agree with that. Um, if we can kind of go a little deeper than the surface, I think that makes all of us very happy. So that's something that's important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. INFJs want to get to the abstract core of who you are, the concept of you, and understand yes. it more thoroughly. So they want to understand your paradoxes, understand the grayness within you. And that is intimacy, understanding the, the ideas that make up who you are. And so having those deep conversations, being able to discuss things beyond labels. So a lot of the world gives us a lot of labels 
And so being able to kind of strip those, you know, strip your job label or, or strip whatever label you have and then kind of having the essence of you on on the table is very yes. vulnerable and very fulfilling uh, to learn yeah. about. Yeah, if, if you can create a safe environment where they feel safe enough to remove their mask, remove their persona, um, I, I think that's incredibly satisfying for an INFJ. If, if we have an opportunity to get to know their true self, that's ultimately the same as, as the INFJ's true self. Um, that's where, I think that's where, um, you know, things can be really ultimately satisfying. Yeah. And another quality of NI dominance is they're very intentional and very purposeful. And so some, sometimes they can get irritated at people who are a little bit reckless or foolish or careless with their actions. And so I would say mm -hmm. one of the things INFJs might want you to know is like sometimes don't get them involved in maybe impulsive, reckless decisions that the other party embarked on. And now the INFJ has to deal with the consequences of all of the actions <laughs> the other person did. Yes. Yeah. I, that, <laughs> that really resonates with me as well. Absolutely. And, you know, I'm just thinking, you know, about my wife, she can be way more spontaneous and, and I, I like planning. I like to kind of know what I'm getting myself into. So yes, I would say that's true. Joyce, are you ready for your compliments yet? Oh, thanks, Jesse. My love language is words of affirmation. So if you want an instant way to get to my heart, <laughs> go that route, because I am a sucker. Jesse, that was that was so nice of you. That's beautiful. Yes. Mm -hmm. Have either of you had experiences with INFJ Enneagram 5s? If so, what differences do you notice? Sometimes people characterize me as an Enneagram 5. I don't know what Enneagram type I am, but... Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, within the tri-type system, I'm a 9-4-5. So I do have, I do resonate with the 5. Um, I haven't met any INFJ 5s. I've met an INFP 5, um, if that counts. And... And honestly, it, it was amazing. It was a great relationship that we had for many years. Um, and I, like I said, I can really resonate with that. And, and that the five really comes out for me with the TI. I think it's my five. I'm just kind of the researching, understanding, getting to the bottom of things. Um, you know, you, I, I can never have enough books. Um, I have a million tabs opened on my browser, just constantly researching things and I love taking in information. So I think that's really where my five comes out. <laughs> yeah. I, I've recently met with a few FI DOM fives and it surprised me. I thought I didn't know that was a sub variant until I started seeing it was. And they tend to appear more TI dominant, like even if they're, I guess, an I, I, INFP true. or ISFP or an INFJ. Um, very true. Very true. Yeah. There are a lot of um, types that do mistype as an Enneagram 5, though. So on online tests, it's very easy to score as 5s. But I do believe those variations are out there. I'm just also, also cautioning people, too, because I've heard a lot of yeah mistypes before, too. Um, but sure. it's the, the combination is completely possible. Like, if you think about... Uh, Tori from Personality Story. She's an INFJ5, so they're out there. They look more TI-ish, like what Kyle was saying. Yes, um, yes, yes. Can you explain the extroverted introvert? When INFJs disappear, what do they do? Oh, the extroverted introvert. Um, I'm not sure what they mean by that. Would that be maybe operating from more of an, an FE reference point, perhaps? Um, I, I don't know, Joyce, if you could add some clarification, perhaps, if you understand this, this question. Um, yeah, so when INFJs disappear from the social scene, why oh, do they do that, I guess? Okay, I, I'm sorry, I wasn't... I wasn't approaching it from that angle. Right. Um, 
Well, I think it's important to know that INFJs need a lot of time alone. And I was unhealthy for, for, a long, for a long time only because I was again operating from that place of FE. Um, realizing that there was something lacking, something missing in my life um, and only experiencing that later when I had the opportunity to have more time alone and really kind of um, seeing the importance of that. So I think it's important for INFJs to to have time alone in a healthy way. I think also I tend to, I could, I could go a week without seeing anyone and be, be perfectly fine. And I think that's, that's maybe a little bit unhealthy. It's good to have interaction. You know, that whole meme about the INFJs loving people and hating people. I can resonate with that. I would say um, absolutely love humanity, love people, but feeling, you know, frustrated sometimes and feeling the need to withdraw, um, feeling overwhelmed. And I experience um, overwhelm, burnout, and the need to withdraw when I'm in crowds, um, when I'm in crowded, you know, like a concert or even a crowded grocery store, a supermarket, a mall. Um, the holidays are particularly stressful for me. Um, you know, again, it's probably that nine hyper empathic kind of being, um, you know, absorbed with with others' emotions and not knowing where where I end and others begin. After that, I feel like I need I need a day or two to kind of be by myself and recharge and just kind of sift through everything that I've experienced. It, it takes a while for me. Got it. Is there something that people misjudge or underestimate about you? How about something that bothers you about people that you usually can't talk about? Yeah, so again, I feel like this is all I've been talking about, but operating from that 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 place of, of FE, um, you know, I felt like for a long time that was the only reference point that I, I would, I could be accepted from, um, you know, the need to kind of put everyone first, the need to make everyone comfortable, make everyone happy. And, and kind of, you know, when I did kind of show NI aspects of myself, they didn't understand. You know, people were like, who, who's this? Who's this guy? You know, like, I just want the comedian. I want the funny, the funny man. Um, so I think they, they failed to understand the, the depth of, of who I was. Um, you know, and that was, I, I'm not blaming anyone. That was to my, my own doing, ultimately. And kind of seeing, seeing that I needed to um, cultivate NI and, and have a little more... Um, you know, silence and stillness and alone time, um, I think was, was ultimately very uh, healthy for me. Um, and the second part of the question, how about something that bothers you about other people that you usually can't talk about? Um, I can't think of anything. Yeah. I mean, maybe what, what Joyce said before is something that I, that I resonate with just the, the spontaneous kind of like nature that a lot of other types have. Um, for me, I need to kind of know about things um, a couple weeks in advance at the very least. I like to kind of prepare, plan. Um, so again, it's all being future oriented, I, I would say. That's the only thing that comes to mind. I'm sure there, there's a million other, other things. Um, yeah. Can, can an INFJ be healthy if they're not helping people in some way? Oh, that's a great question, Christina. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I suppose. What do you mean by healthy? And I think having relationships is is part of health, um, ultimately. Um, you know, and you can obviously define that in, in, in a multiple of ways, but having, um, having deep relationships with people, being able to express 
parts of yourself, being able to open up to people is really, really a part of health. Um, and again, that, that kind of comes into the whole holistic aspect of, of health and wellness. Just having relationships um, um, is really important. And can you be healthy without that? Not in, not in a holistic sense, I would say, if that makes sense. Yeah, helping people is a necessity to be healthy. Uh, yeah. Service, being of service to people, being of service to the world. Serving is a part of being happy because being happy is being connected. And one of the best ways to stay connected with the world is through giving back. And when you give, it sends subconscious signals that the people you give to are worth giving to. And that actually makes you feel better about the world too, because you feel like you're helping people in a meaningful way and that they're worthy of help too. So a lot of actions we do come with subconscious cues as well to it. So when you help someone, you're telling yourself, this is a person worth helping. And in that sense, you bring up the value of other people as you help them in a strange way. Beautifully put. Joyce, absolutely beautiful. Totally relate to that. That's great. What are some important lessons you've learned in life? Okay. Um, yeah, I suppose I'd have to think about that. But um, yeah, I would say, you know, kind of going deep. I just recently learned the, the IFS um, therapy perspective. But that's ultimately what I was doing for many years, even um, not knowing that particular model in, in many ways. So I think being compassionate, having self-compassion was an amazing lesson for me. Um, having compassion for these different parts of ourselves. You know, I think INFJs can relate to an inner critic, an inner perfectionist. So having compassion for those different parts of us have really, really helped me. And, that, and that's been an important lesson for me. Mm. Yeah, well put. Do you have any hobbies? Yeah, um, I make music. Um, that's a hobby of mine. I love ambient music. I, I love making music. That's, a, that's ultimately a flow state for me, I would say, um, music making. Um, reading, you know, the classic kind of INFJ responses, I suppose. Um, reading, I love taking walks in nature, hiking, um, being with my family. Yeah, with the ambient music, it is linked below. And I believe it's Enneagram theme related for some of them, right? Or so, yeah, it's, it's really just... Um, psychological and spiritual development related, I would say. So um, just music that aids in contemplation, music that aids in deeper thinking, meditation, um, other aspects of healing, like uh, sleeping even, insomnia. Mm -hmm. Got it. And so this will be the last question of today. And so I'm interested in how you structure your thoughts on spiritual and personal development. With juggling all perspectives, how do you get a handle on things? Right. That's a great question, too. Um, structure your thoughts on spiritual and personal development. Um, I feel like that is an INFJ thing, isn't it? You know, going back to even um, David Hawkins. I don't know, Joyce, if you're familiar with David Hawkins. He had the concept of the, the ranges of consciousness. I think an, an INFJ approaches theories, systems in a very um, kind of systematic way. Um, they, they like to bring things together into a system and approach it um, in a very kind of um, holistic, systematized way, if that makes any sense. So, you know, similar to Ken Wilber is another INFJ that approached similar disciplines in that way. And he talks about psychology and spirituality and, and how to bring those different aspects together and really penetrating to the unity of everything, I think is another, um, another important aspect of that. Um, so those are some people that have really helped me um, I think if you approach 
you really were standing on the shoulders of giants, um, INFJs. I mean, if looking throughout history, we can look at some of these historical figures that have all had similar approaches to their realizations. And I think by kind of cherry picking um, some of these approaches, you can kind of see the underlying unity of them. Um, and once you see the underlying unity of them, you can begin to see the un underlying unity of, of many, many, many different psychological and spiritual um, traditions and approaches. And it's the whole idea of, of perennial philosophy, really. The idea that, um, you know, at the core of all of these traditions, there's a deep kind of um, structure that they all share, a deep kind of unifying structure that they all share, a deep kind of unity. Um, yeah. A, a yeah. Unity, I would say, yeah. Mm -hmm. I hope I answered your question, Cosmic Lady. That's, that's beautiful. Yeah, great, it is a beautiful question. question. Yeah. The questions today have been spot on. Very yeah. moving questions to answer. Yes. Thank you so much for everyone that participated in this. I, I really, really appreciate um, Joyce, you as well, just bringing all of this together. This has been an amazing opportunity. So thank you so much. Absolutely. Yeah. And I find it very NI and also very TI to find a unifying theory of the reality underlying it all because yes it's essentially all leading to the same thing and you're kind of able to interpret the grayness as it's simply the same kind of grayness set in slightly different ways from different angles well, yes thanks yes. jesse yes. <laughs> it's always nice to have you complimenting in the live chat and it makes my day because compliments are the foundation of my existence. So, yes. Yay. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Marina, Lex, Mamu, and Jungkook. Thank you. Um, anyone else, um, feel free to get in touch with me um, through the Instagram. Everything's linked below. I'd love to, to further some of these discussions. So thanks so much, everyone. This has been lovely. Yeah. And thank you, Kyle, for your wonderful sexual nine insights and <laughs> yes. your theories of non-dualism and your holistic perspective on life it is much appreciated. And his Enneagram, um, the golden roots, and also his pages on herbal medicine and acupuncture and music are linked below. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thank we you. love you all very much. And we'll see you in the next episode. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.